Hey, how you doing? This is Adam Post, publisher of more than a thousand comic books, and I've been covering all the goings on at Disney and Marvel these past few months very intensely. A lot of videos based on it. This one is really interesting because Ike Perlmutter apparently owns about $2.4 billion worth of Disney stock because of his deal where he sold Marvel to Disney in 2009. So unfortunately, Bob Iger has gone berserk with inclusion, and as a result, the stock is doing terribly. It's not just the inclusion, it was also Bob Iger's sloppiness with choosing Bob Chapek to take over for him, and but then also fighting with Bob Chapek and not really letting Bob Chapek do the job. Although I have to say, honestly, I don't think Chapek was cut out to be CEO of a company like this. Plenty of other people could have done a good job but not with them forcing inclusion on it. Now, inclusion is fine, but this new thing that's gone through a lot of mass media, the inclusion take that you've got to have inclusiveness in everything and it's got to be part of the story, it throws off the story. Officially in 2020 is when Disney decided they were going to announce their groundbreaking change to the key system. First since its inception, a fifth key would be introduced entitled inclusion to complement the original four branches of the Disney philosophy and amplify the reach of their potential as well. This was their strategy. In 2020 is when they officially did it. Their intention was to broaden access and diversity in their industry by adopting inclusion standards across Disney General Entertainment and live action studio productions by the end of 2022, which they did. They made this expensive priority that is not merit-based what they'd be focusing on. Their stock has done terribly. That's not the only reason for the stock doing badly. A lot of it is just mismanagement or focus and not having a concern about what fans want because what fans want is not inclusion. What fans want is their brands to be well represented. You want a Star Wars movie to look like a Star Wars movie. You want a Marvel movie to feel like a normal Marvel movie not have all this extra agenda-driven political messaging and ideology in it. And if you're Ike Perlmutter and you're sitting there and you're saying, you know something, I sold Marvel. Ike sold Marvel to Bob Iger on a handshake with the understanding that Marvel was going to be treated well and the properties would be treated well and focused and they'd be run well like a business. And for the first few years, things went fine. This is not why Ike sold Marvel to Bob Iger at Disney so that Bob could turn it into some inclusion nonsense. He sold it so that he could diversify his holdings because Ike took Marvel out of bankruptcy, built the company back up, created Marvel Phase 1, which was an incredible success. But by that point, had decided, you know something? I've got like a, he had like a billion dollars of his net worth or so tied up into it at that point. He's worth 4.3 billion now. He did not need to risk everything and have the stress of running a company at that point. So a deal with Bob Iger looked like the right thing to do. And Bob Iger at that point hadn't done anything crazy or terrible. Unfortunately, he's since done a lot of things that are crazy and terrible. So let's get into this article in a little bit more detail. Billionaire Disney Insider becomes pivotal figure in Nelson Peltz's proxy fight. Before we do, please be sure you're subscribed to the channel. Click the bell for notifications and give me a thumbs up. This is from Financial Times. Marvel chair Isaac Perlmutter owns a large stake in Disney and is supporting the activist push for a board seat. A key question hanging over Disney as it battles a challenge from activist investor Nelson Peltz concerns how many of its shares are held by one of the company's own employees, Marvel chair Isaac Perlmutter. Perlmutter, the main backer of Peltz's push to gain a seat on the Disney board, became the company's second largest individual shareholder in 2009 when he sold Marvel to Disney in a cash and stock deal worth $4.2 billion. One of the reasons why when you sell a company and you get stock in exchange, you don't get taxed immediately for the gains and the results if you hold the stock. There are tax reasons for it. That's why you don't just immediately sell the stock. Sometimes also you're expected to not sell the stock as part of the deal to show that you have faith in the company. At the time, only Steve Jobs held more shares, which he acquired after selling Pixar to Disney. It's unclear how much the stock the reclusive Perlmutter, who technically reports to Chief Executive Bob Iger, still holds. Assuming Perlmutter has not added or sold Disney shares since the Marvel deal closed, his stake would be worth $2.4 billion, about 1% of the company according to Financial Times calculations. Only investors with 5% stakes or more have to disclose their holdings publicly. So if Ike Perlmutter actually owns 4.99%, he doesn't need to tell anyone publicly that he owns it. With a stock value of $2.4 billion now, and the stock currently at $110 and would be lower if not for the interest that Nelson Peltz has created in the company because Nelson Peltz has made it obvious with a few intelligent changes and although it's not being said openly and publicly, obviously with the removal of the inclusion key that only Disney has, other media companies are doing this stuff, 
that I've seen only Disney is pushing it this aggressively across their entire company at a tremendous cost to shareholders. But people understand if that was to go away, the stock could easily go back up dramatically because they could begin to focus on their franchises again. However, a 40% drop in the value of the stock, just doing some rough math, is it, which is what happened in 2022, is a billion dollar loss, a billion dollar personal loss for Ike Perlmutter. The size of Perlmutter's stake matters because a large holding could tip the scale in favor of Peltz's Tryan partners if the proxy battle is as close as some of the firm's past fights. Peltz, who acquired a $900 million stake in Disney last year, is known for his activist campaigns against big consumer products groups, including Procter & Gamble in 2017. In that proxy fight, both sides spent more than $100 million each to woo shareholders, with Peltz winning by a paper-thin margin of 0.002%. So here's some things of note. Peltz put in $900 million of his company's investment money. Not all Peltz's personal money, but it doesn't matter. Ike has more than $2.4 billion on the line, if the Financial Times is correct, because it's already diminished by an amount of, my, at this point, maybe it's 30% it's diminished. He's down a billion dollars. So he's got like three and a half billion worth of play in this game that you would think, aside from being pushed aside from Iger, which is quite annoying, because look, Kathleen Kennedy, you know, anyone at any one of these companies that Iger got involved with, the only person treated with disrespect was Ike Perlmutter. There would be no Marvel at Disney if it wasn't for Ike Perlmutter. You have to imagine if you're Ike Perlmutter, you're pretty annoyed with Bob Iger at this point. Other significant individual shareholders at Disney include Jobs' widow, Laureen Powell Jobs and Lucasfilm's George Lucas, Disney hopes they will vote against Peltz's move to gain a board seat. Having an employee support an activist challenge to a large corporation is definitely a unique situation, said Drew Chapman, chair of the shareholder activism department at Cole Schatz, a law firm. It appears that Peltz started looking at Disney because of his relationship with Perlmutter. Of course, you have to imagine Perlmutter is constantly, when they're meeting up and hanging out in West Palm Beach, where they both live, Perlmutter is saying like, this idiot Iger has destroyed the company and this cost me personally over a billion dollars. I would be pretty loud if I was like Perlmutter. He added that big individual shareholders help each side in a proxy contest to build support. Disney, more so than other companies, has a large retail investor base, which has its own challenges to building support. Having prominent large shareholders starts to help build the numbers. Peltz's activist campaign has become a distraction for Iger, oh poor baby Iger, who returned to Disney as chief executive in November with a mandate to revive the company and its sagging share price, which by the way, is absolutely impossible to do. There's no way that Iger, with his inclusion agenda that he attached as a new key, a new key, a new focus at the company, along with these other four key elements that were part of Disney's keys, safety, courtesy, show, and efficiency. And then they added in inclusion and threw that on top of it. Like, okay, that's not good. So there's no way that Bob Iger can fix this company. No one could fix the company with that built into the system. You have to focus on fans first, and then you can do whatever you want to do. Iger is expected to discuss restructuring and cost-cutting plans when the company reports on February 8th. Iger had a tense relationship with Perlmutter during his first stint as chief executive, so much so that Iger often delegated communications with Perlmutter to Bob Chapek. There's respect for you. According to former employees, Chapek served as chief executive for 33 months before Iger returned. Perlmutter is said to have been outraged when Iger reorganized Marvel in 2015 to allow film producer Kevin Feige to report to the head of Disney Studio, not Perlmutter, a move analyst said has proved to be wise but I will tell you has proved to be completely idiotic, dangerous, and destructive. That was the beginning of the end for Marvel and the rest of the Disney brands. Peltz and Perlmutter began seeking changes at Disney months before Iger's return as chief executive. According to documents that Disney filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission, Perlmutter called Disney board members Safra Katz and General Counsel Horatio Gutierrez last July to advocate for the activist board seat. He met Chapek in Palm Beach, Florida, not long before his dismissal as chief executive to lobby on behalf of Peltz. And Bob Chapek was going to go for it. You can tell Bob Chapek was going to go for it. And that's the real thing that got Bob Chapek pulled out of Disney as an absolute emergency. Because without Chapek fighting Peltz, Peltz would be on the board 
and would have fixed this inclusion silliness right away. Perlmutter and Peltz, both octogenarian billionaires, are friends that live in Palm Beach. Their foundations have jointly donated to the local Salvation Army, and both were Trump donors. In his book, Iger describes Perlmutter, legendarily tough, reclusive character, and is having a reputation for being cheap to the extreme. But while he acknowledges having disagreements with Perlmutter, he respected where he'd come from in his life. Perlmutter served in the Israeli army in the Six Day War of 1967 before moving to the U.S., where his first job involved standing outside Jewish cemeteries in Brooklyn and being paid by grieving families to lead funeral services. Perlmutter is a completely self-made man. He sold surplus goods, he invested in distressed companies, and Marvel was a company that he had to fight to get control of. They had licensing deals with Marvel where they were making toys through their company Toy Biz and wound up getting control of Marvel through the bankruptcy. Following Disney's acquisition of Marvel, Perlmutter's brusque style and strong opinions often put him at odds with colleagues as the Financial Times reported in 2012. A female employee alleged that Perlmutter said he had a bullet with her name on it after a disagreement about an email. In a sign of closeness between their relationship, Perlmutter attended the wedding of Peltz's daughter last April, resulting in a rare photograph of the Marvel chief. Perlmutter is so publicity shy that he attended the 2009 premiere of Iron Man in a full disguise. So Perlman does not want to be seen. He does not want to be photographed. On last Thursday, Tryon issued a statement recommending Disney shareholders replace board member Michael Froman, the former U.S. trade representative with Peltz. Tryon said Froman had overseen weak corporate governance at the company and that Peltz would bring a shareholder mentality to the boardroom. Because as Peltz said, he's got $900 million actually invested in the company. No one else on the board has any kind of significant investment on behalf of themselves or anyone else. They're not really shareholders on the board. That would be Peltz. In response, Disney said it did not endorse Peltz or his son, Matthew, who was running as an alternate to Peltz. Such a move, the company said, would threaten the strategic management of Disney during a period of important change in the media landscape. I mean, threaten the strategic management. Of course, it would challenge the management because you'd have to go and say, excuse me, did the board vote on this inclusion key? Was this put to a shareholder vote? Because this inclusion key concept, even if it's completely well intended, has changed the entire operations of the company and the focus of the management of all of their brands and dramatically affected all of the shareholders. They knew it was going to affect everyone. But was this voted on back then? I don't know if it was voted on. I think I would have heard of it if it was. If you know it was voted on, let me know in the comments below would love your two cents but don't you think if they're going to change the entire focus of all the content they're producing all of their operations all of their recruiting all of their management of all of their intellectual property isn't that something shareholders should have a say in it shouldn't just come from say bob Iger having a thought or maybe a friendship with some political people. I don't know where that came from. Bob Iger should be in big trouble just for that alone. Some Wall Street analysts say they do not expect Peltz's push for a board seat to succeed. Iger remains popular among investors, says Jason Bazinet, analyst at City. I'd be shocked if a lot of people voted with Peltz, Bazinet said. There's so much goodwill that Iger and his institutional investors have, you'd be stunned if they back an activist and slap Iger across the face. Well, Iger clearly does need some slapping around. He's cost a lot of people a lot of money. He's made major changes to the company through this key initiative that doesn't seem like it was ever even voted on by shareholders. This was something that if you pointed at and said, excuse me, if you're going to change the entire focus of all the operations and all of the content of all of the company, you're going to have to put it to a vote with a proposal that shows that it's financially reasonable to do this. And if it's just something like it's being a good shareholder corporate citizen to do something like this, you'd still better be able to account for how much money this is going to make us or how much money this is going to cost us. And if the answer is, hey, I don't have numbers to back it up, man, then the change should have never happened. My take is Peltz is going to have a hard time getting on the board, but it doesn't matter. This isn't the first time Peltz has done this. He's done this with more than 30 public companies. He gets his way eventually in almost every case. And Peltz hasn't started coming out with Perlmutter or anyone else starting to talk about the whole woke agenda, all this inclusion key nonsense. He hasn't done that yet. If he needs to do it, he'll do it and he'll get very aggressive and he'll street fight and he'll win. He'll create at least enough doubt and difficulty that it'll be impossible for Bob Iger to get the confidence of Wall Street any time in the next several years. Iger loses, Peltz wins. That's how this game ends. But let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you agree? Do you think Iger's gonna lose and Peltz is gonna win? Love to hear what you guys have to say. Please be sure you are subscribed to the channel. Click the bell for notification, give me a thumbs up, and I'll see you again soon with another video. And if I don't see you, I will miss you.